In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord, I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. trusted in your steadfast love, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation.
salvation for all you came to bring. O Lord Jesus, God's own Son, our mediator at the heavenly throne, hear our cry and grant our supplication. The Lord be with you. And also Let us pray. O God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because of the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing. Grant us your grace to keep your commandments 
that we may please you in both will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the first Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The Lord also for salvation, and Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. Our soul waits for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle is from 1 John chapter 4. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us, God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord.
Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Martin Luther's last words inscribed in paper were found scribbled on a note next to his bed. We are all beggars. This is true. After all his learning, after his life of study of the sacred scriptures as a doctor of theology, this greatest of minds that God gave to the church came to this 
and only conclusion. We are beggars. This is true. To think anything else is to fool oneself. From the beginning of scriptures to the end, this is the case. It's what God said of man in Genesis chapter 2. God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and man became a living being. You get your life and everything that you have from God. What is really being said in that chapter is that Adam was a beggar. Would God in a moment take away what he gave? Man would die and return to the dust. Adam was to live hands out looking up, realizing that there was nothing in himself that could preserve himself or keep himself alive. The original sin was that the devil tempted man that he could be more than a beggar. Instead of a life of trust and reliance on God, he could learn to lean on himself. Just eat of the fruit and you will be like God. That temptation was a temptation for self-sufficiency. In other words, to be opposite to a beggar, to be rich. In the gospel for today, we see that played out. There's a rich man, and there is a poor man, a beggar. We are that beggar, weak and sick, cast at the rich man's gate. That rich man represents this world and its people, and what it holds forth is valuable and good. We are in this world, yes, but we are not to be of it. We desire crumbs, but we may not get them. All the while, the world has what they need, are full and satisfied, enjoy life and have all they want. We, however, are castaways, having nothing, no righteousness of our own, no good of our own, barely surviving and hanging on. And yet this is what God in our holy baptism has returned us to, a life of prayer, a life of begging, a life of subsistence, believing that God will give us what we need. This is the good life under God, a life of lack and want, like baby birds opening their mouths to receive what God gives. The riches, though, that we sometimes crave and want to be like the rich man in our weakest moments, are really the desire to be autonomous. We think life would be better if we were not beggars, if we could provide for our needs, if sickness, deprivation would never befall us. We would need no one, not even God. God aims to teach us in the life of begging however profound things, that the world's clothes are temporal, soon to rot, only clothing on the outside. The world's feasting feeds nothing than to satisfy an inner hunger. Further luxury and happiness in having everything, not being a better beggar, leads to a life full of oneself. Life under God teaches us to feel sorry for the rich man and where he is headed and what he thinks matters and is good and to desire only a life begging with our fellow beggars and begging for the one lone good. We enjoy the daily dole. Life begging is much easier. We have a rich king in heaven. He'll give us our daily bread. He'll give us what we need. We live content. It is our life, and we want only it and nothing more. We're the richest beggars that we know. To be a beggar means to trust in God. Sure, we have sores and wounds, and our friends are only the unclean dogs who come to comfort us and lick our wounds, but all things will be healed in the life to come, and the angels know our name. Sure, we may daily experience the groaning hunger and painful lack of what we are, but we shall one day be filled. Sure, we have poverty of spirit, lack of any spiritual good ourselves, but ours is the kingdom of God. We live trusting in God, in his righteousness, in the one who became a beggar for us. Jesus came and had no place to lay his head. He was born of a virgin who had nothing but rags at his birth, nothing but rags to wrap his body in. 
No fancy cradle but the arms of a loving mother. No home but a warm barn filled with animals. He too at the end of his life was buried also in rags. And yet he suffered for our sins. He died on the tree to pay the price for our redemption. He died as the greatest beggar to fill our poor souls with food that feeds and to clothe our cold and naked flesh with eternal clothes that are radiant, sparkling and white, his own righteousness. For us beggars, God gave his life, saving us from sin and hell. God said to Abram, don't be afraid. Abram, I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. Abraham responded and said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? You have given me no offspring. One born in my house is my heir. At this moment, God took Abram out. See the stars, Abram, so shall your descendants be. And on that starry night, who did Abram see? But he saw you in the distance, each star representing a person who too one day would believe. Abraham was comforted by the host of beggars who, like himself, would live in this life as those having nothing, not seeing anything in this life as worth having but Christ, trusting in him, those looking to the life from God that he would give. And the Bible says that Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord credited to him his righteousness. What is asked of a beggar? Only this, to cry to God and to listen to God speak his promises and to simply believe them, to live from the word that God speaks. That is righteousness. And Abraham was righteous by faith. Accepted by God and loved by God, Abraham believed the Lord, and so are you. Having that is having something greater than anything that the world can provide. Righteousness is the God who gives what he demands and who credits those with righteousness who trust in him and in his mercies. Righteousness is that which comes by faith in Jesus, where all of his righteousness is given to you. You are to see this beggar's life as something worth having. God promises to be your shield and your very great reward. He's what you need. Having him and his righteousness in the death of Jesus is all that matters. Indeed, many may feel sorry for the beggar, but the beggar was quite content. And all in all, he had more in having God than the rich man ever had. And in God, he had all that he needed. In this lifetime, everyone remembers the name of those who are important and rich. In this life, everyone who would have referred to the poor man simply as that beggar outside of the rich man's gate, not remembering the beggar's name. But in heaven, the rich man's name is forgotten, not even known. In the parable, the poor man is given the lordly title of beggar, or the poor man is, and is also named Lazarus. Look through the gospel text and see if you can find the rich man's name, for it's not there. There's no name at all for the rich man. There's only a name for the beggar. He who was known by no one in this life had an identity, a name known by God. He was one who was baptized and loved by God. He had a heavenly consort coming to comfort and bring his soul and death to Abraham's bosom, and he lived by faith. This he believed, as his name Lazarus means. God has helped. Yes, God has helped even him. God had given him all that he needed. You may have in this life nothing good as far as the world sees or numbers it, or sometimes as you see or number it. But really it is to see that being a poor beggar means having all that God gives. Luther's whole approach to Christian life was summed up in his last words. We're all beggars. This alone is true. Anyone who thinks he's rich is merely fooling himself. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, God has become a beggar too. God identified with us in our neediness. God came to the ditch where we were. 
and lived to lift us up to heaven. Today we rejoice in God's promises and His Word that come to us in our profound need and deprivation. For us beggars, God gives His life. That is what we receive. And having Him, we have all that we need and all that is worth having. Having Jesus and His righteousness for the richest beggars that we know. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue our prayers with the great litany, including also today those requesting our petitions and needing our prayers. We pray for Rob Weiland, Jr., recovering from hip replacement surgery, for Nancy Altman, who searches for a new job, for Virginia Meyer, recovering at home from hospitalization, for Bev McDonald, who's undergoing extensive radiation therapy, for Betty Trim, and for Emily Badaracco, who is in her last weeks of pregnancy, and also for wisdom for our leaders, for our country, and for our people in this time of civil unrest. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, Hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy. be gracious to us. Pray us the Lord. Be gracious to us. Help us the Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death. The Lord, the by the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, us, we poor sinners implore you us, to rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to sustain them in holy living, to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. We glory to, hear us, Lord. to raise those who fall, and to strengthen those who stand, and to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed. We glory to, hear us, Lord. to give to all peoples concord and peace, Preserve our land from discord and strife. To give our country your protection in every time of need. To direct and defend our president, governor, and all in authority. To bless and protect our magistrates and all our people. To watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation. To protect and guide all who travel. To grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage, and to have mercy on us all. To forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanders, and to turn their hearts, to give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, 
Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. O Christ, O Lord, O Christ, O Lord, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you.